The COVID-19 pandemic shines a light on the lack of trust we have in science and medicine and the ugly fact that this lack in trust killed so many of us. I'm a pediatrician and something that sets the practice of pediatrics apart from adult medicine is that in any given situation, there are always at least three people, a doctor, a patient, and a caregiver. For this three-way relationship to work, pediatricians are trained to establish trust very quickly. This three-way relationship is how we create the space to start building that trust. The New England Journal of Medicine published a review in 2012 that found that more parents trusted their child's care provider when communication was geared towards collaboration, a sort of teamwork that's lost when the entire team is only two people. I'm also a trained combat soldier. And on the battlefield, if you can't trust the person leading your squad, you will die. Unfortunately, despite the fact that patients didn't trust their medical leadership, we were all thrown into a pandemic combat zone in early 2020. No general would ever have allowed this kind of unit into battle because it would cost too much human life, which it did, which it still is. When I first had the idea to talk about this, I was naive. I honestly had no idea how many people have been personally hurt by medicine, physically hurt, harmed, emotionally scarred. The more I asked, the more stories kept coming and at a certain point I needed to walk away. All that hurt and yet somehow so many in the field had no idea it was happening. I went into medicine because I refill my emotional tank by helping people. I don't rest until my little patients are medically safe. There are times that I spend days away from my own children because somebody else's child needs me more. I just couldn't fathom that there were doctors not like that. But I was wrong. Some aren't. And now, knowing this, how dare I ask anybody to consider trusting the medical field when the truth is, the field doesn't deserve it. But I'm a mom. And soon, my kids are gonna need an adult doctor and I won't be able to control the kind of medical care they get. For them, I can't back down from this conversation. For them, I have to speak through this embarrassment and ask to be heard. Because what's stronger than my shame in the pain that's been done is my fear that we keep letting this happen. We, doctors and patients, we can't sit with this anymore. So today, I dare talk about trust. And the best definition of trust I've ever come across is this one by Charles Feltman. Trust is choosing to make something that's important to you vulnerable to the actions of someone else. There are times where we let ourselves trust somebody. For example, when that check engine light comes on in the car, do I trust that I won't be upsold or overcharged? No, but I end up in a garage where I can trust that I won't die on my drive home because of faulty brakes. See, we choose to trust the mechanic every time we put our family back in the car after it's been tinkered with. Trusting somebody with something that's important to us is not new, but what's the opposite of trust? How about not feeling safe? When we don't feel safe in our time of need, we naturally go elsewhere. Did you know that the alternative medicine industry is worth $100 billion nowadays? That's a 38% increase from pre-pandemic 2019. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of benefits to these practices, but what this tells me is that more and more patients are seeking medical advice outside of Western medicine. When we don't believe that our health 
our well-being are safe in the hands of doctors, we naturally seek help elsewhere. How did we get here? Let's take a moment to shine a light on only some of the ways this problem got so big. This list does not encompass all of the ways in which discrimination can be found in medicine. Still, a population that I work quite a bit with are the LGBTQ adolescents. Now, in general, those who identify as LGBTQ plus are less likely to seek medical attention. A large population survey out in Canada looked at the why and found that for the most part, it was out of fear that they wouldn't find a doctor they could safely turn to. In other words, they did not feel that they would be kept safe and they have the historical evidence to prove it. Why are the things that we need to survive so expensive? 2020, out in California, they compared COVID-19 patients and found that those from the richer side of town were less likely to be hospitalized with their COVID than those from the poorer side of town. The idea is that it probably has to do with access to fresh and healthy foods, preventative health care, in general, the privilege of living a healthier lifestyle before they got sick. But the bottom line is this, the sicker people were the ones who were poorer. We have deep rooted educational gaps and they're causing us a lot of problems. By all measure, I'm a very educated woman. I have never been taught customer service or how to run a private practice. Let's take that all the way back to high school where universally students don't all get taught the ins and outs of the scientific method. Well, it's no wonder people are having such a hard time speaking the same language. This is a lot. And unfortunately, there's not a single solution because the lack of trust is not a single problem. It's the outcome of a whole lot of problems. And even though the pain and the harm is not your fault, fixing it is our collective responsibility. Ultimately, I wanna empower each of us. Go out, find that trustworthy doctor. Don't stop until you find them. But until we do, what are we supposed to do to keep ourselves safe? Let me tell you about Dr. Barrett. She was telling me that the strict no visitor policy in her hospital resulted in a lot of her patients fighting for their life alone. Seeing how much this was bothering them, she decided to start bringing an iPad in with her every time she examined them. She'd use that iPad to call whichever loved one her patient wanted that day. And suddenly, it wasn't just the two of them anymore, but this three-way relationship was formed. By being present, even virtually, this third person contributed to improved patient experience for her patients. A large study published in the Journal of Education and Health Promotion found the exact same results. Not only improvement in patient outcome, but improved patient satisfaction scores from 55% to 61% with this intervention alone. I think that that's something tangible that we can all commit to, making it a universal expectation that we will have a third person at every doctor's visit with us. Somebody to help us remember what questions we wanted to ask, or take notes with us, or even just to sit there silently as a visual reminder to the doctor that even though we're adults, we are somebody's loved one, and we deserve the utmost respect and the best medical care. Right now, it feels a lot like doctors and patients are at war with each other. All the while, our common enemy, disease, keeps costing us casualties. We have to start making room for trust in this relationship because only side by side can we finally win this war.